Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo sports talk and more. My name is Patrick Moran. Thank you very, very much to everyone out there, as always, for listening, for watching, for following, for subscribing. I appreciate you all very, very much. Uh, Today is our Wednesday episode, day before Independence Day coming up here tomorrow. Uh, This is going to be our weekly pie bag episode. This, of course, is the episode where you control the narrative, your questions, your comments, your takes. I will reply to a good solid handful of them. We got some good ones too today. A lot of Buffalo Sabres stuff. So this is going to be kind of sort of a Sabres centric episode, which has been for the past couple of days. And that's for good reason. There's a lot going on with this team right now. Maybe not a lot that fans necessarily are happy about, but a lot going on. Not so much with the Buffalo Bills, although we do have some Bills content on this episode today, but obviously that's going to be changing real soon. Right now, the Sabres are doing what they're going to do, and then it'll be quiet for quite a while. And meanwhile, the Bills will ramp up because training camp is just a couple weeks away, and we will be diving into more Buffalo Bills content than you could ever imagine on the show. Very much looking forward to that. But anyway, some Bills stuff and a couple other things going on at the end of uh, this episode. A couple quick notes, and then I want to dive in. I don't want this to be too long of an episode today. Tomorrow, we're going to have, it's not new, so it's not new content, but on the show tomorrow, which will be an audio-only version. So if you're watching this, you like to watch this on the video side, you're not going to see an episode here on Thursday. You'll have to go to like Apple or Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts to check it out. Not new content, but what I'm going to be doing is uh, I did an interview with Eric Wood a couple of weeks ago, not on this show. Uh, Eric was kind and gracious enough to ask me to be a guest on his Center on Buffalo podcast. And we had a really good conversation about the Buffalo Bills talked a little bit of wings. Eric is a big wing guy. Obviously I am as well. So we talked about that little bit of pizza stuff, even at the end. And I'm going to, with his permission, of course, um, I am going to take that entire audio interview and that's going to be the premise for tomorrow's episode on a holiday. So if you didn't check that out on Eric's show center on Buffalo, make sure you tune in again, audio only tomorrow. That was a lot of fun. And quite frankly, a, and I don't say this lightly, a big, big honor to have somebody like Eric Wood ask me to come do his show and be a part of it. So that was awesome. I'm going to play that interview tomorrow. And then on Friday from Imperial Pizza, I'm going to be with brand new, and I mean quite literally brand new Channel 4 sports reporter and anchor, uh, Carl Jones, just new to the market, literally is just starting in Buffalo, I'm going to sit down with him. I've never had a conversation with Carl, not a person anyway. The only thing we've done is exchange a couple Twitter X uh, DMs to get this show set up. But I'm going to sit down with him at Imperial Pizza. We're going to talk about his life, his career to this point, what got him the Buffalo, of course. I'm sure we'll be talking some Buffalo Bills as well. But anyway, that's going to be Friday's show at Imperial Pizza. Uh, one other thing, too, I just want to make sure I give some props right now. 26 shirts just went over this week. $2 million in money raised since they launched, which is a little bit more than uh, than a decade or so ago. Big, big, big congratulations, props, Del Reed, and not just Del Reed, obviously his entire staff. You know, Del is awesome. That's my guy. But it's not just Del. It is a complete collective team effort with that staff at 26 shirts that makes everything work. But man, oh man, $2 million plus right now in charity and counting. That is really, really special. So I'd be remiss if I didn't sit here and give them a huge congratulations in some of the props that they so very much uh, deserve. I know this sounds cheesy, but I mean it, man. I, I, the, the world and certainly 
the Western New York community, Bill's Mafia is a better place because people like Del Reed and the staff at 26 Shirts exist. So big congratulations uh, to them. In terms of some actual news, not covered on the pod bag, but some actual news. We're recording this relatively late into the evening on uh, on Tuesday night. The Buffalo Sabres did make an addition. They made a couple of additions, actually, but one NHL, well, maybe NHL addition, a goaltender. They signed James Reamer to a one-year contract for $1 million, a one-way contract, which basically only means he's going to get that money, whether he plays in Buffalo or whether he plays in Rochester. And quite obviously, I would think the plan is definitely short of an injury or Devin Levi being a disaster during preseason and camp. The plan would be for Reamer, I'm sure, to be uh, insurance in Rochester. He's 36 years old. Um, statistically, he's been good. Last season, he played 25 games with Detroit, um, 11 and 8 2 record, 0.904 save percentage, 3.11 goals against average. For his career, he's played 501 games and he's got a 2.88 goals against average, a 0.910 save percentage, and a Really impressive record, actually. 215, 117, and 63. Again, the problem, not even a problem, but the fact of the matter is he's 36 years old and he is insurance, so don't get it twisted. Don't look at a million dollars and look at a one-way contract and think that this is the number two goaltender. I certainly do not think that is the plan. Of course, some people will know James Reamer as maybe a little bit of a homophobe, man. He had an issue with uh, with Pride Night. I don't really want to get into that. If you want to look it up and make your own assessments and judgments, feel free. Not going to talk about that on this show today. It's not really what we're talking about here with James Reamer. But in terms of hockey, I'll say this. Objectively, I don't hate this. If it's for the right reason, I definitely don't hate this move at all. Again, to me, this is, or at least it sure should be, insurance uh, in case something happens with UPL or or Devin Levi, as opposed to him being the number two and Levi going back to uh to Rochester. So in that regard, I think he's an upgrade over Eric Comrie from last year. Eric Comrie, much younger, of course. He's still hopefully got a lot of hockey out of him. He just went back to Winnipeg. But I think for right now, this season, you probably would consider if he has to play in Buffalo, James Reamer to be uh an upgrade. That said, though, look, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. It's another Low end, meh, meh deal. That's what it is. Also, the the Buffalo Sabres full schedule came out on Tuesday. A couple of news and, and notes from it. We already know that they're starting the season, I think, overseas with New Jersey back to back games, but their true home opener Thursday, October 10th against the LA Kings. Uh, the Sabres are playing six of their first nine games actually at home. So a good chance to, to win some. Some uh, some spirit from the crowd. Get off to a good start. Play well early in the season. The Sabres have struggled really, really bad. Not even last year, but also two years ago when they barely missed the playoffs. They have not played very well at home. Well, maybe with Lindy Ruff as head coach, they'll get a chance to to right that chip because six of the first nine are at home. Uh, they are home the night before Thanksgiving and then also the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. They played Minnesota on Wednesday. Vancouver's a Black Friday 3 p.m. game. New Year's Eve, they're at Dallas. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, which I always look forward to. They are at Boston. And then last but not least, if the Sabres happen to get to games 81 and 82, and they're in a playoff hunt where they still could make the playoffs if they haven't clinched already, um, they're at home versus Toronto. And they're at home versus Philly on April 15th and 17th, respectively. So they're ending the season with two at home. And again, maybe, just maybe, those games will uh, be meaningful at the end of the season in terms of the playoffs or maybe even who the hell knows, playoff positioning. And yes, I know I'm being really uh, ambitious there. But anyway, right, let's dive in. Enough talking, enough uh, bullshit here at the top. I want to get into some of these. And again, these are takes... Except for this first one, I was going to say fans because they're not fans necessarily, especially not this first one. But how we get these each week is quite simple. And if you want to be featured 
on this weekly show, it's simple. Leave a comment on one of the YouTube videos. Almost, I don't want to say every day because there's not going to be a video tomorrow's show, but almost every day there's a video version on YouTube. Simply leave a comment. If I like it, if I think it's something that fits with the next show, I will pull it. Or you can tweet at me at Patrick Moran TV, or you can email me at, or not at, Talking Buffalo Podcast at gmail.com. That's how I came up with the submissions from this week. But let's kick it off with my co host, um, my part time co host, I should say, on Wednesdays, uh, Tone Pucks, who's not here this week. Kind of not happy about that either, but um, he chimes in and says this. He got at me. He says, Since I can't make it in person, see if this take makes the cut. Jeff Skinner is pretty much Victor Olofsson with personality. We're just going to ignore. That all he got was $3 million. Don't tell me he's betting on himself. He could score 35 with McDavid, hit the market again, and you know you want to know what he's going to get? Three fucking million. That's his words, not mine. Exactly what his chump ass was worth. All right. I don't care. Let's let's start here. You know, you know Tom Bucks is a man with um some pretty strong takes, and I don't always agree with him. I kind of do in parts here, but not fully. I'll, I'll say this. I don't give a shit about the money, man. I don't care about the money. He was already under contract. The Sabres were not in any kind of salary cap hell. This was a hockey move. This was not a we got to create cap space move. You know, the Buffalo Bills made some moves. Jordan Poyer, uh, Mitch Morse, Trey White. I think some of those moves were made in large part because of the salary cap. Jeff Skinner was not cut or bought out in this case, I should say, which is the NFL or the NHL equivalent because of cap trouble. So I really don't care about the money and what he was getting paid or what he got paid in the open market. Although I know what Tone's doing here. He's illustrating the point that Jeff Skinner hit the market and he wasn't going to be some guy who was in demand and go get four years at $5 million per anything like that. But I don't care about the money, at least not in terms of the Sabres. So that means that means zero to me because this was a Kevin Adams, a Lindy Ruff, a Terry Bagula move. This was not about money. Well, maybe it was because to some extent you are talking about Terry Bagula here. Anyway, look, the whole, and, and I get it, man. And I'm not talking about Tone Bucks specifically, which in fairness to Tone Bucks, man, and if you follow this show, he's been on Jeff Skinner. He's been on, on a heater when it comes to Jeff Skinner for months literally for months, but generally speaking from fans, like the Jeff Skinner hate on the way out the door to me is kind of wild. I mean, what kind of player did you, you know who he was, you know what he is. Jeff Skinner didn't do shit else, but score. That's all he did is score. He didn't check. He don't play defense he scores goals. That's what he does. And he's done it well. Even last year, I mean, he didn't play well. He got demoted near the end of the year. Fought through some injuries. Still scored 24, though. Still popped in 24 goals last year, even despite all that shit. Year before that, 33. Year before that, 35. So 24, 33, 35 goals over the last three years. I don't feel like adding it up, and I didn't do it beforehand. And I'm not going to try to do the math in my head right now. But those are pretty impressive numbers. At least goal scoring wise, it is. You don't think they're going to miss that? Especially based on what they've done to this point. Is this team better with Jeff Skinner in your top six or top nine? Or are they better with Jason Zucker, who was a fourth liner last year with Nashville? Now, I'm not going to sit here and bash Jason Zucker. First of all, I don't know that much about him, but um, you know, from what I've read, he, I know he played on the fourth line last year w- with Nashville, but I know he's got third line, maybe even second line potential, but hell man, look at the goals and the Sabres need goal scoring. You know, one of the things we've talked about so much on this show when it comes to the Sabres is they are so dependent right now. Like if Tage Thompson doesn't pop in 40 some goals. Dylan Cousins doesn't take a step up, but Jack Quinn doesn't stay healthy. They're really dependent, top heavy on guys to score. Not enough guys score goals that they can count on. And they just got rid of one of them. And look, let's be real clear here. I don't want to 
because I, I could feel it in my in my head when I was saying it. I am not sitting here and defending Jeff Skinner. I talked about this literally yesterday. I'm fine with losing a player. I just thought they were going to do something bigger. I thought they were going to make an upgrade, just like the Buffalo Bills with Stefan Diggs. You cut Stefan Diggs, or I mean, I'm sorry, you traded him to Houston. You ate the cap money. I get it. That was a lot to do with financial, whereas Skinner's all hockey. But the process, the mindset to me was still the same. I'm fine without Stefan Diggs. Where's the upgrade coming? This is one move that's going to lead to a bigger move, which didn't happen. Jeff Skinner so far is a big move that I thought, and I'm sure a lot of you did too, which is why so many people are probably pissed off. It was a big move that was going to lead to a bigger move. But that hasn't happened. Jason Zucker is not the bigger move. He's just not. Not that he's a bad player, but he's not the bigger move. Oh, by the way, P.S. Unrelated. Victor Olofsson, I didn't even see that. He went under the radar a little bit. Signed with Vegas one year, $1.1 million. Wouldn't that be some shit if he goes to Vegas and becomes like a, a 25 to, to 30 goal scorer? Again, that'd be uh, pretty wild. Anyway, look, I, like I said, I just... I'm not going to bash, bash Jeff Skinner. Um, I think he's a better player than my guy Tone Pucks does simply because, yeah, he only does one thing, but he does it pretty damn well, and that's score. And I would not be shocked. You know, in Tone's statement, he mentioned, you know, he was talking about the money part, but he could score 35 with McDavid, hit the market, and only get $3 million again. Well, I'm thinking 35 goals. With McDavid, he scores 35 goals. That's 35 goals that the Sabres are going to miss. Anyway, at Pistol Pete 74 72 says, Sabres objectively earned between a C minus to a C plus grade on free agency. Signed players they desperately needed more of grit, compete, minute eaters, penalty kill, size. They offloaded players they didn't need. And they are supporting a young core with experienced role players. Nothing flashy, but it's an improvement. Thank you very much for that take, Pistol Pete. And I'm going to tell you, man, in a lot of ways, I agree. I do. They got guys that they desperately needed on the back half of the forward uh, lines, the rotation. They got grittier, more compete. Penalty kill, minute eaters, size. By the way, sounds like Lindy Ruff type guys, doesn't it? They got rid of some guys they don't need. Gergensons, Olafson, Skinner. Nothing flashy but an improvement, he says. And again, in ways I agree. They did get better on the back end in the depth chart. No doubt about it. Lafferty, Malenstein, uh, Obey Kobo, or Kubo is probably a decent improvement over Krebs and Akposo and Gergesons or Robinson, whoever you want to put on that fourth line from last year. I think without question, the Sabres fourth line is better right now than it was last year. But my thing is this, it's not enough. It's not enough. I just said it. My issue is who puts the puck in the net if Tage and that first line is not going. If one of those guys get hurt or if that line's struggling and they're off, who's putting the puck in the net with regularity? Because it ain't going to be the guys they signed. It's not going to be Lafferty. It's not going to be Malenstein. It's not going to be Obey Kubel. Hell, I don't even know if it's going to be Zucker. Any of the guys they just signed. They need a minimum. They need a top six player. So they need to get a top six player. And ideally, they really need to get a true third line center. And so far, they've got a neither. And it's worth noting, and people have told me as I've overreacted on social media over the first couple of days of free agency, it ain't over yet. It's not over. Free agency's over because there ain't shit out there in terms of free agency. But there's potential players out there for trade if Kevin Adams is willing to give up maybe more than what he is at this point. More on that in a second, by the way. But again, it's just that they're line center. I mean, what have you seen? Like right now, a lot of people, at least in pencil, are slotted in Peyton Krebs to be that third line center. I would ask you this, folks. What about Peyton Krebs have you seen that suggests that his four goals in 80 games last year 
or his nine goals in 74 games the year before. So 13 goals in about 154 games over the last two years is going to translate to success as a third line center with more opportunity. He got a little opportunity, not a lot. He got a little bit last year to move up on a line and at least statistically scoring wise did not cash in. So I just, to move him as your third line center, because that's what he is right now, at least anyway, I just don't buy it. I don't buy that working. Krebs and Greenway, Jordan Greenway right now, they're going to be two thirds of a third line that pretty much has fourth line offensive ability. And I'm not no Jordan Greenway hater. I like him. He's got a nice role on a, on a hockey team. He's a useful player. He does some nice things. But at the end of the day, Dude, he never scored more than 12 goals in his career. So now you got Krebs, who had four goals last year on your third line. You got Jordan Greenway, who's never scored more than 12 in his entire career on your third line. So that just that doesn't sound promising to me. The Sabres, for all intents and purposes, I mean, if you want to put Benson or Zucker on that line, let's put Zucker on that line. Along with Greenway and Krebs, the Sabres basically essentially right now have two fourth lines. That's what they have. And they could also do better defense. We're not really talking about much about defense, but you know, I feel like they could do better than Connor Clifton, who should probably be their seventh defenseman, probably. So I don't know to, to that point. I don't know that you can grade the Sabres free agency period. And even if you add Malin sign in over draft before free agency started, I don't know that you can grade this a a C plus or even a C this off season because what they need more than anything is a top six guy, at least one top six guy and a third line center. And they've addressed neither of that to this point. So there's no way that's a C you're talking as far as I'm concerned, C minus, maybe even D plus anyway, quick break, come back some more Sabre stuff. And then we'll dive into a few bills things as well. Right after this break. You know, it would be nice to talk about the Sabres and feel positive when I'm doing it. I go back to being on the show with Joe Yurden weekly almost two years ago and just so much promise with that team. And they were just so much fun to watch and they were fun to root for. It, it, it was an entertaining brand of hockey. You were going to be entertained, win or lose, and they damn near made the playoffs. Before that, a train wreck. And I hated the team. I like hate watched them. I almost feel like I'm back where it began with this team. Like I'm hate talking about them right now. In October, I feel like I'm going to be hate watching them. That's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, at Optimation underscore coach. Face the facts, folks. It's not fun to hear, but it is very well known that many, many players just do not want to come to Buffalo. That leaves one to overpay and develop from within. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Optimation coach. Um, <laughs> preaching in the choir, dude. Yar. Jason and Zucker getting a year for $5 million. That's the kind of free agent they're going to attract right now. That's what they're going to get. You know, if he doesn't sign with Buffalo, and he goes to Edmonton, if it's the Oilers that are calling him, if it's Dallas that's calling him, he's probably getting like three, maybe three and a half million at most. Three, there's a reason why he's a Buffalo Sabres, because the Buffalo Sabres have a need, and he's a guy who would come here for the right price, and in this case, it was $5 million. He does some things well. Ain't nobody going to tell me that dude is worth $5 million, even for one year. No way. No how. That's a product of losing, man. That's a product of losing. I have a take on him, though, by the way. I think he comes here this year to get him for one year, $5 million, And I feel like Darcy, uh, I said, almost said Darcy Vergeer. Wow. Kevin Adams' mindset is going to be play for half, two-thirds of the season. At some point, he's going to be a guy you flip. You're going to flip him before the trade deadline, send him to a contender, 
You'll get a draft pick back. And at that point, maybe it's Kulik, maybe it's Savoy, maybe it's Rosine, who the hell knows. But somebody who's not up on this team will get called up and have the opportunity to take his minutes. That's how I feel like it's going to play out um, with him. But anyway, when you get a guy like that and you're paying $5 million for one year because you can't get anybody else, um, you know, it's a product of losing. And there's other factors too. I mean, let's be honest here, folks. You got to be honest about things. New York state tax sucks. Shitty ass weather in the winter. Winter blows for most people, at least anyway, up here north in, in Western New York. And look, I know people hate hearing this. But for outsiders, Buffalo ain't the most fun town in America. Outside of wings, if you're not getting wings or drinking at some of the breweries, getting some food, it's not the most luxurious place. Now, if you live in Buffalo, you love it. And a lot of people on the Bill side, on the Sabre side, who probably weren't keen on coming to Buffalo, they get here, they fall in love with the city, they fall in love with the culture of Buffalo, and they end up making this their lifelong home. We've seen it happen many times. So you can fall in love with Buffalo, but to the outsider, I'm talking about the outsiders here. It's, it's just not a destination place to play. So the fact of the weather, the taxes, maybe a lack for some people, you would say of, of things to do other than stuff your face with wings and, and drink beer at taverns. You take that away. And the fact that the team sucks and it's not a destination place. It's a product of losing, man. It doesn't, if you win, the other stuff ain't going to matter, right? If this team starts winning, some of these guys that wouldn't give the Sabres a second look right now, they will in a year or two. If the team's winning, if they're winning, but they're not, and they haven't, and who knows when they will again, if they will again. Um, Tony Baumler says, starting to think you don't watch much hockey. Look, bro. By the way, Tony is in uh, my fantasy baseball league. I say this shit openly. Outside of the Sabres, you're pretty much right. I lock on the Sabres, but I don't lock on the rest of the league. There's good players, even some like maybe at least like borderline stars that I barely even know. And I've admitted that. There's some good unrestricted free agents that have signed some relatively, you know, significant or at least notable deals over the last couple of days. I barely even know who the fuck these people are. I'm, I'm trying to lie about it. I've said it before, man. I'll say it again. When it comes to outside of the Sabres, because I do feel like I'm locked in on the Sabres, but outside of the Sabres, I rely on my trusty uh, sports media folk, man, to, to really keep up. There's a handful of media here locally in Buffalo that I love reading up on to get some perspective. I follow some of the national people I read as much as I can. That's how I keep up with the NHL. It's not me watching other teams play. I don't watch hockey if the Sabres aren't playing, unless sometimes it's the playoffs and obviously I'll watch the Stanley Cup. But outside of that, dude, I ain't fronting. I ain't fronting on any of y'all. I'm not, I'm not trying to make you think then I'm locked in on hockey like I'm locked in on football. Or at least I'll tell you that I'm locked in on football because I watch a shitload of football beyond just the Buffalo Bills. I'll watch anything Bills related. I watch all 22 of Bills opponents. I'll watch them all 22, just some random games or at least some highlights of other games because I like to stay locked in on the NFL. Don't really care about the NHL outside of the Buffalo Sabres. Now, maybe if they play well, I'll start to care more and pay more attention around the league. Um, a couple more here, Sabres wise. At Ron Femi at 31, it's been fairly clear that Kevin Adams overvalues prospects and rumored people don't want to deal with him because he's unrealistic. Hopefully he could get past this because this is uh, of this use, the buyout money is unacceptable. No, I, I might have read that. Not the best there. Basically, what Ron is saying is that Kevin uh, Kevin Adams overvalues his prospects, which makes it incredibly difficult, if not unrealistic, to trade with him involving prospects. And he's saying that they need to find a way to get prospects dealt to get a player in here that will more or less take the place or maybe even be an upgrade over Jeff Skinner. 
because you bought Jeff Skinner out and you're not making any real use of that money other than signing a bunch of bottom of the depth chart players. I think I said that right, Ron, right? Well, I agree with you, man. I do. I don't know what the future holds with these prospects like Savoy and Kulik, Oslin, uh, Rosine, not to mention the one I just drafted, Henny is in the first round now, but it feels like a lot of highly touted, highly rated, skilled board prospects and not a lot of roster spots anytime in the next few years. I mean, you factor in Tage Thompson, Dylan Cousins, they're locked in already. Guys like Jack Quinn and J.J. Paterka, Zach Benson, ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Probably the same for Alex Tuck, who I just feel like he's going to be a perfect fit for Lindy Ruff, by the way. But doesn't seem like there's a, a very clear and open path for a lot of these prospects. I mean, I guess at most you could say the Sabres, I just said a handful of minutes ago, they basically have two fourth lines right now. Well, Jordan Greenway, Greenway last year of his contract. Krebs is a restricted free agent now. Uh, Zucker's only here on a one-year contract. Maybe next year you wipe that line out and you're talking, you got guys like Kulik and uh, maybe Oslin, Savoy, some combination of that. Is, um, maybe that could be your, your third line, your top nine type line. But for right now, it's tough to see a path. It really is. So I'm kind of waiting for something to uh, to happen still with a trade. But, you know, it goes back, takes two to tangle. And the NHL, one thing I learned about the NHL that I didn't really, never realized until now is how many players have some form of no trade clause in their contract. It's crazy. Whether it's a full no trade, limited no trade, but it doesn't really matter. Because if a player has any no trade rights and they can only list three teams, Buffalo's probably on that list of all of them. So ain't nobody want to come here, dudes. It's just the way it is right now. Nobody wants to come here. No one's waving their no trade clause to come here right now. So you got prospects that you don't want to give up to begin with. And then it becomes almost impossible when you're trying to target guys who don't want to come here. So as much as I bash at times, Kevin Adams, it's kind of stuck between a, hard, uh, a rock. Get that right. A rock and a hard place. Good God, it's late. <laughs> um, at Bill's Mafia EP, he, meaning Kevin Adams, also told us he interviewed like 12 coaching candidates. He's the Vaughn Miller of the Sabres. That's funny. And it's true. It's true. He did say that before they hired Lindy Ruff. I don't think he said he interviewed 12 people. He certainly said he talked to double digits. I remember him saying that. But look, man, Kevin Adams' like press conference behavior has been weird lately, if not annoying. Whining last week about wanting to make trades, but being unable to, that it takes two teams to, to tangle. Pretty vocal about, almost like borderline upset, like, hey, guys, I'm trying. I'm trying to make a trade. Get off my back. It's kind of like, that's what it felt like last week. Then a handful of days later, Monday late afternoon, with a bunch of fourth liners and some Rochester depth quality goaltending, he puts a flag pretty much in the ground and proclaims that he loves this roster that he has right now and that he thinks this team is considerably better. They're not. They're not considerably better. I promise you that they're not. But yeah, it's been really weird right now with uh with Kevin Adams and some of his comments at these press conferences. I got to be completely honest with you. I had to go to a break in part because I kept losing my voice. I felt it and heard it cracking a little bit. So I had to take a quick little break, get a little uh, fuel in me, get a little something to drink, and hopefully I'll be able to hold up here for the last handful of minutes of this episode, which... I want to turn to, uh, well, for now, we'll do a couple of Bill's comments that I have. At Marquise Man 88 Training camp is almost here. Give me one or two surprise storylines that you think we're going to see. All right, I'm going to drop two on you right now, but 
I'm not going to deep dive into these. First of all, relate into a show. Secondly, I think these are going to be some storylines that require and deserve to have more detail and discussion. And I'll have them with maybe a couple bills related guests, but two things that I think might surprise some people is one as of right now, David Edwards, it feels like he's been handed the starting left guard position. I don't think that's going to happen. I think I'm not saying I don't think he's going to win the job or, or keep the job. I just think he's, he's going to get pushed. And I think that either Leal Collins, a veteran who didn't even play last year, but mostly has played right tackle, but he has played guard before. And I know, I think it was Brandon Bean who said that he's, they plan on him being a tackle on this team for depth. But I would not be surprised if he kicks inside the guard and he gives David Edwards a run for a starting job. Or, and here's a name that nobody talks about. You want to talk about a player going into camp that no one talks about that flies under the radar that you might hear plenty about when camp starts? Alec Anderson. Keep your eyes, keep your ears on him. He could push David Edwards for a spot. And not on paper right now. It doesn't look like there's any competition for David Edwards. But I would not be shocked if Collins or especially Alec Anderson ends up in a true starting positional battle with Edwards at camp. So that's one. And then the other one, I can't believe I'm saying this. And by the way, I'm still struggling to get through this right now. I can feel it. Anyway, Chase Claypool. What? Chase Claypool? Yeah, Chase Claypool. Maybe he's more than just an OTA darling. And it's funny coming from me because I don't know anybody that was more critical and rolled their eyes when the Bills signed Chase Claypool than me. Hated the signing. Still don't like the signing. I still wish they would have did something different, almost anything different. But we heard a lot about him looking good in OTAs. And that's what I said. He's going to be more, maybe he's just more than a little OTA darling because I think he's going to go to camp. And I think he's going to get a fair shake. And I could absolutely see him challenging Justin Shorter for that wide receiver six spot, making the roster. I mean, you're you're pretty you're not pretty much. You are locked in Samuel, Shakir, Keon Coleman. Those three are more locks to make this team, minus, of course, a, a, you know, a, a catastrophe injury. But then you got Matt Collins, four. You got MBS. That's five. MBS is no special teams value, though, but that's five. And I think you got Claypool and Justin Shorter for a one spot. If they were to keep seven, it'd probably be somebody like a Hamler who can return kicks or somebody they just completely trust, like maybe an Andy Isabella. But I think Chase Claypool is going to go to camp, and I think he's going to have a very, very, very realistic opportunity to battle Justin Shorter, both who will have to play well on special teams for sure to uh, make this roster. But, you know, a couple months ago or a month ago or so, I said, it's a joke that Chase Claypool signed with the Bills or that the Bills signed him, I should say. Now I'm like, hmm, maybe this could be a, a surprise uh, storyline in training camp. That certainly I don't see coming. Maybe you do. Um, at Tim and then I can see Josh, meaning Josh Allen, walking into everywhere with the Lombardi, if they let him. Yeah, basically what he's saying is if the Bills were to win a Super Bowl, he could see Josh Allen walking around carrying the Lombardi trophy everywhere he goes. Very Bryson DeChambeau-ish. Um, totally could see it. Which, by the way, P.S., I love what Bryson, I love golf, and I love what Bryson DeChambeau is doing for golf right now. Um, I'm kind of new to his YouTube page, but he is teaching people how to play golf on his channel. First of all, he's putting out really entertaining content, but he's, I don't know any professionals that put more time and more effort into their videos to teaching uh, people to play golf right now than Bryson DeChambeau is. I think that's uh, really cool. But yeah, for sure. Josh Allen will walk around town. He'll walk everywhere. Probably with no shirt on, just like Bryson DeChambeau and carrying a Lombardi trophy everywhere you go. Mark Swenson says, Last Bills one here, by the way. Enjoyed the show and chat with John Scott at Imperial, although I'm not the guy who asked him for a selfie in the Imperial parking lot. And I really like the conversation about Greg Rizzo. He has to be great this season because you cannot count on Vaughn Miller or uh, Dewan Smoot. All right. What he's referring to, thank you, Mark, for that, is John 
talked uh, on the podcast, told the story about how somebody in the parking lot when he met me at Imperial Pizza last week stopped him and said, hey, you're John Scott Channel 2. And the guy wanted to take a, a selfie with John. John said it was the first time that's happened to him in public since joining Channel 2. So that that's funny. But yeah, we did talk about Greg Rizzo and John really emphasized that he's got to be great this year, not just good or not just fine. I think John called him a fine player because you can't count on Vaughn or DeWan Smoot. Yeah, look, he's got to be the guy this year. He's got to stay healthy. He's got to get double-digit sacks. That's why you draft a guy in the first round. And in fairness to Greg Rizzo, he was hurt. I, I think he, I know it was his foot. And I don't want to say what the extent was if I'm not sure. But I, I, from what I hear, let's just put, let me rephrase that. From what I hear, he, his injuries, actually the last two years, have been a little more significant than reported, than what most people think. He's played through a lot of shit. Hasn't missed games, but has played less than 100%, not even close to 100%. But anyway, yeah, they need him healthy. This could be a breakout year for him. He could be playing for an awful lot of money, and he needs to get the double digits of sacks. To me, he's one of the most important players on this football team, bar none. You know, Josh Allen is obviously number one. As long as he is playing for the Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen is going to be the most important player on his team. But right now, I put after him, I think I would put, I think I would put Greg Rousseau right there with Deion Dawkins and, like, say, Matt Milano of players that you need to play great and stay healthy and be out there for 17 weeks, man, for sure, for sure. A um, couple more here, not sports stuff, actually. KC Pro 88. It's good for Buffalo in general to have this power struggle cycle of whose wings are better, keeps all these places sharp. You know what, man? You're 100% right. You're 100% right. There's a lot of talk on social media, at least on Twitter, X, from the people I follow and, and the comments that I monitor. Everybody's got takes about chicken wings. And that's what I love about it, man. So subjective. It really is. Competition breeds quality. And it's wild. I mean, you get your... One or two places like Barbill, everybody loves Barbill. Seemingly, everybody loves wing nuts as well. And not against any of those places, they're great. But there's so many other places. And there's people out there who don't like wing nuts. And there's people out there who think my take that 9 11 Tavern's best wings in the world, that I'm dead wrong and that they're overrated. Yada, yada, yada. You could just keep going. But yes, to, uh, to Casey Pro's point, being talked about all the time does keep you sharp, man. and does keep you pushing. A lot of these places are starting to have more uh, wing nights, some specials, because the fucking prices are getting out of hand. So at least they have a night where there's a special. And the quality keeps going up and up because they have to be. Because in Buffalo, there's so many great spots that if you go somewhere and you have a shitty experience, man, there's 20, 30 other places you can go and you can enjoy some wings. So... Absolutely. Like I said, competition breeds quality. That's a great take. Um, last two here. At Josh Drag Race 0688. 55 bucks to walk in the door is funny. See, you know, you'd be lucky to get a seat in the nosebleeds for that price nowadays in the Sabres Arena. Thanks for that. All right. So what he's talking about, I talked about this on the show, I think on Monday. Um, I went to Nickel City Comic Con at the Buffalo Convention Center, and that was my lone complaint. 55 bucks to walk in the door on a Saturday. And that did not include a single thing, literally, other than being able to walk in the door. Um, 55 bucks to have the right to go spend a lot more money at many, many dozens and dozens of merch tables and a couple concession stands. And then, of course, they had a couple rows actually of celebrity meet and greets where if you want to get your picture taken or get an autograph with the celebrity, maybe some group photos of some people, it's going to cost you money. Everything there costs money. I'll say this because some people are like, well, it's cheaper than going to a, a hockey game. Yeah, but you know what? If you pay X amount of dollars to go walk, he said, you know, to walk into the Sabres arena, I don't have to buy anything else. I could sit there and I could watch the game, right? I don't have to buy concessions. I don't have to buy anything to drink. I don't have to buy anything to eat. I paid for my seat. I could watch the game. Really, with the convention center, with, with Comic-Con, you're just paying to walk around. You can't do shit unless you spend more money. Well, 
technically, I guess, as I'm saying that, maybe that's not true because you get at least people watch, which is really cool. I don't know. Regardless, I'm, I'm not saying this exactly the way I was hoping to, but yeah, 55 bucks to walk in was kind of, in my opinion, stupid when there's so many other things you're going to be spending your money on. But all in all, it really was awesome, which kind of leads to my last, uh, my last take here, or, or I should say comment from somebody. Paulio says, what were your highlights of Comic-Con? People watching, I just said it. People watching <laughs> next level when you go to something like a Comic-Con, which I think I've only been to one other one in my entire life. But the people watching was amazing. Uh, seeing Shannon Elizabeth up close and personal, amazing. She still looks gorgeous, man, by the way. Absolutely gorgeous. Shannon Elizabeth still looks like she did 20 years ago, pretty much. So that was awesome. Uh, spending a a fun Saturday summer afternoon with my friends was pretty cool. I know I'm getting cheesy there. And the last thing, and this is really cheesy, but it is what it is, man. Just, you know what else I really liked about it? Just seeing so many people who were happy. Like everybody there was in a good mood. Maybe that's one good thing about uh, about going to something like Comic-Con. Like if you're kind of on the fence about it, you ain't going to go spend 55 bucks. So if you're spending 55 bucks, you're going there to have yourself a good time. You want to be there and you're happy to be there. So maybe my earlier take actually kind of sucked here in hindsight. But yeah, man, just seeing so many people happy, uh, anime stuff all over the place, you know, cosplay people, superhero costumes all over the place. Now that really ain't my thing, but people were just so happy to be there and to connect with other people. It's like, this was their element, and you could just, you could tell, man, that part of everything, without question, was awesome. So all in all, a really good time. They're coming back. October, I think I saw a, a flyer. I don't know who the celebrity guests are going to be, but October 17th, or no, 12th and 13th at the convention center, there'll be another Nickel City a Comic Con. I'll tell you what, I'm already looking forward to it. So I'm bitching and crying and moaning about spending 55 bucks walking in the door. Guess what? I'm going to do that shit again. <laughs> Definitely going to do that shit again. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this episode. I apologize. Pretty long episode here. And I've, my voice has thrown out on me several times. I've kind of mumbled over my words a little bit here and there like a complete idiot. So hopefully if you stuck through here to the end, you can hear me kind of apologizing to you. Like I said, one more time, replayed tomorrow, my conversation with Eric Wood, Friday, Carl Jones, Channel 4 sit-down conversation that we're doing at Imperial Pizza. Uh, thank you very much again for listening. Have an awesome, 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 and safe 4th of July. Talk to you soon.